We read from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 6. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let us stand before our God in prayer. Almighty God, Indeed, strength and beauty does dwell in thy sanctuary and among thy people as we gather in thy name today. We come before thee, our Lord, looking unto Jesus Christ as, that, as the one alone who makes us acceptable in thy sight. We pray, Father, that thou would cleanse us and wash us uh, through thy forgiveness and pardon, that our Father, thou would grant to us a zealous hearts, lifted up in praise and thanksgiving to thee, that we would not simply go through the motions of worship today, but that, Lord, we would gather in thy presence to hear thy word and to give to thee the worship and glory that thou art deserving of. We pray, Father, receive now our worship through the mediation of our Savior, who is at thy right hand, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Please turn in your Psalters to Psalm 132. We'll be singing uh, verses 10 through 12. In this portion of the psalm, we are reminded how the Lord established a covenant with David that upon the throne of David, his seed would reign and continue to reign. And this ultimately points to the... Lord Jesus Christ, the greater David, the seed uh, whose kingdom shall never end and whose power and whose righteousness and whose glory rules over his church. And so we honor and glorify him today, even as we sing our psalms on, unto him. Uh, this is for his glory and for our edification I'll be lining the psalm out for the sake of our small children and for those who do not have a call, copy of the Psalter in front of them. We'll be using the tune Weatherby. Dun, 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 dun. For thine own servant, David's sake. For thine own servant, David, say, do not deny thy grace. Do not deny thy grace, nor of thine own anointed one, nor of Thine own anointed one. Turn thou away the face. Turn thou away the face. The Lord in truth to David swear. 
turn from it. He will not turn from it. I of thy body's fruit will make. I of thy body's fruit will make. Upon thy throne to sit. Upon thy throne to sit. My covenant, if thy sons will keep. My covenant, if thy sons will keep. And laws to them made known. And was to them made known. Their children then shall also sit. Their children then shall also sit. Forever on thy throne. Forever on thy throne. Let us continue our worship this Lord's Day. Turn in our Bibles to our Old Testament scripture reading, Genesis chapter 36. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth, and Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashemath bare Ruel, and Aholibamoth bare Jeush, and Jaalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives, <clears throat> and his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts, and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than that they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Ruel, the son of Bashemath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman and Omar, Zepho and Gatan and Kenaz. And Temna was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. <clears throat> and these are the sons of Ruel, Nahath and Zerah. Shama and Mizza. These were the sons of Bashemath, Esau's wife. <clears throat> and these were the sons of Aholi Bema, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. And she bare to Esau 
Jeush, and Jaalam, and Korah. These were dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz, Duke Korah, Duke Gatam, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. And these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, <clears throat> Duke Nahath, Duke Zerah, Duke Shammah, Duke Mizah. These are the dukes that came of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Bashemath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife. Duke Jeush, Duke Jaalam, Duke Korah. These were the dukes that came of Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these are their dukes. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Ana and Dishon and Ezer and Dishan. These are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Horai and Hemam, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. And the children of Shobal were these, Alvan and Menahath and Ebal, Shepho and Onam. <clears throat> and these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Ena. This was that Ana that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. And the children of Ana were these, Dishon and Holy Bema, the daughter of Ana. And these are the children of Dishon, Himdan and Eshban and Ithran and Kiran. The children of Ezer are these, Bilhan and Zeavan and Achan. The children of Dishan are these, Uz and Aran. These are the dukes that came of the Horites, Duke Lotan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zebion, Duke Ana, Duke Dishan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dishan, these are the dukes that came of Horai among the dukes in the land of Seir. And these are the kings <clears throat> that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Denheba. And Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his stead. And Jobab died, and Husham of the land of Temani reigned in his stead. And Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. The name of his city was Avith. And Hadad died, and Samla of Masrika reigned in his stead. And Samla died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead. And Saul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his stead. And Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died. And Hadar reigned in his stead, and the name of his city was 
Pelu. And his wife's name was Mehet Abel, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. These are the names of the dukes that came of Esau, according to their families, after their places, by their names. Duke Timnah, Duke Alva, Duke Jetheth, Duke Aholibama, Duke Elah, Duke Hainan, Duke Kenaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mibzar, Duke Magdael, Duke Iram. These be the dukes of Edom, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. <clears throat> Whenever we come across genealogies, we are brought to the scripture. We don't skip over genealogies because they are as much a part of scripture as any other portion of God's word. Uh, besides uh, the names that are very difficult to pronounce, they, they have uh, a purpose, obviously, that God has included them in his word. In, there may be uh, many purposes and reasons for doing so, but uh, I think that genealogies uh, for the righteous trace, again, uh, the, the, the families whom God blesses, whereas the families like the family of Esau, God mentions them and, and shows the, their descendants because God's wrath, God's curse abides upon those families. Uh, and uh, again, it's important for us to realize that uh, if we want, again, God's blessing, not his wrath, not his curse to dwell upon us, uh, then we must, as parents, uh, we must, as children, we must hold up the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must uh, trust in him. Uh, he must be. Uh, the one to whom we look for all that we need in this life, who, him who is both Savior and Lord. And when we do so, we are assured that the blessing of the Lord accompanies our families as we, as we serve, seek to serve him. <clears throat> Let us come before the Lord our God in prayer at this time as God's people. <clears throat> With the psalmist, uh, O Lord our God, we come to thee and we cry out, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. We come unto thee, Lord, because thou art the only one who can hear and answer prayer. The, the gods of this world uh, cannot hear and answer prayer. Uh, Lord God, uh, any other created being cannot hear and answer our prayer. It is thee alone, the living God, the eternal the omnipotent, infinite God, to whom we call out Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray our Lord and our God today that thou would exalt thyself, magnify thy mercy and grace before us as well as thy righteousness and holiness. O oh Lord, we pray that we would not casually enter into thy presence now, but that, Lord, we would understand that we are upon holy ground, as it were, when we are in thy presence with thy people. We have gathered, O oh Lord, uh, upon Mount Zion. We have gathered, O oh Lord, in uh, the new Jerusalem. We have come before thee to bring unto thee the worship which thou Thus deserve and is becoming of thee alone. 
and we bring not that which we think is best. We bring that which thou hast ordered, that which thou hast appointed. And we pray our Lord that as we do, that thou would receive our worship through the mediation of our Savior. For we thank thee that though he has died for us, been raised for us, he continues even his work as our high priest interceding for us now, praying that our worship would be acceptable in thy sight. We pray our Lord that, that thou would hear our thanksgiving even as we call upon thee now. We thank thee for opening unto us the wisdom and the examples of saints from the past, those saints that are revealed in scripture uh, whose example we would follow, in whose steps we would walk, as well as those, the Lord, since the closing of the canon of Scripture, who have stood faithfully for thee, faithful witnesses and martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank thee that thou dost continue to teach us, uh, even through what they have left for us, by way of their writings, by way of faithful churches, and uh, who have passed on to us confessions and creeds and and who have passed on to us catechisms and covenants and directories that are agreeable to thy word. We thank thee, our, our Lord and our God, <clears throat> that thou hast not left us in darkness. We deserve to be left there. We deserve not the light which thou hast shined into our life through the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. But Father, we praise thee that that light has shone and we run to that light. May we hate our darkness. May we hate our sin and the corruption within us. May we, Lord, not run from that light, though it exposes what we are inside. But Father, may we embrace the light that we might flee from that darkness. We thank thee, our Lord, that thou <clears throat> has been pleased to keep us out of the hands of wicked deceivers. And Lord, we pray it, if it is thy will that we will someday suffer uh, for truth and for righteousness. We pray that we will suffer for well-doing rather than for evil doing. Our Lord, we Come to thee confessing our sin as well. And we are thankful for the promise that we read in thy word. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Lord God, we confess that we have tolerated sin in our lives. We have played with it, we have not fl uh, fled from it, we have run to it. And Lord, we ask that thou would have mercy upon us. We also confess we have done a lot of talking about reformation, the reformation thy church needs, the reformation that this nation and the nations of this world need. But, oh Lord, we have not done what we ought to do in promoting reformation, beginning with our own life and in our own families. And, Lord, we pray that thou, our God, would stir us up to not simply be those who, who talk the good talk, but do not walk the good walk, who do not practice what we profess. Lord, for the many inconsistencies and contradictions that exist in our life, Lord, thou dost see them all. They are not hidden from thee. Our Lord, we pray that thou would have mercy upon us, forgive us and cleanse us. We confess becoming complacent uh, in the time of blessings that we take for granted the blessings that thou has given unto us. 
And we also confess despairing and fearing and complaining in the time of trial and heartache and sorrow. Rather than looking to thee, our Savior, uh, who takes us through the valley of the shadow of death. But Lord, let us remember that when thou dost take us through those difficult times, thou hast promised thou art with us. We confess not improving upon our baptisms, improving upon sermons that we have heard. We may be convicted, but there are so many times, O oh Lord, is no change in our lives. We confess not counting it joy to suffer for Christ. We confess our unforgiving hearts. We confess not using God, God's gifts uh, for his glory, whether our eyes, <clears throat> our ears, our mouth, our hands, our feet, our resources, money, strength, not using them to promote the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We are very glad to receive these gifts, but oh God, we show our thanksgiving for the gifts thou hast given to us by our willing support of thy kingdom thy ministry our lord and our god forgive us for not loving our brother and our sister our neighbor as ourselves not loving thee with all of our heart soul mind and strength as we have confessed our sins we are assured that thou hast heard as we plead for thy forgiveness and come to thee through jesus christ there is forgiveness with thee. Lord, use this worship service, we pray, to draw the sinner unto Jesus Christ. Use this worship service to sanctify the, the mind, the heart, the emotions, to sanctify the work and deeds and thoughts of thy people that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, beginning in our families, beginning, O oh God, to show forth reformation, a desire to be reformed, to be what thou hast called us to be, Christians. Let us not make excuses, Lord, for our own sins uh, in our families, always pointing the finger towards someone else, but never considering how we have contributed to the conflicts, the troubles that we face in our families. Humble us, our Lord and our God, for there can be no blessing as long as we are proud, that we refuse to repent of our sin, that we refuse to obey thee and walk in faithfulness, to be the husbands that thou hast called us to be, to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for the church. And wives to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. So wives submit in the Lord unto their husbands and parents to lead and set godly examples before their children and children to walk in faithfulness and obedience to thee lord uh, it is not easy for any of us by nature to submit to those who are over us but oh lord there is not a greater principle found in thy word by way of submission submission to thee and thy lordship submission to all those thou hast placed in authority over us for we show really the condition of our own heart by our willingness and our desire to be submissive to those in authority over us. And we show our, our love for Jesus Christ and our desire to be like Christ in the way we, we shepherd and guide and lead those entrusted unto us. 
Our Lord, we pray that thou would be with our children, grow them up, set a hedge about them that would prevent them from falling into uh, the, uh, the many wiles of the enemy, temptations that would fall away from thee gradually, help them to understand as children who are growing up into young adults that, oh God, uh, there are so many temptations that the enemy uses to draw their hearts from thee. Lord, we pray, grant to them light to see and understand what the enemy is about. He seeks their destruction. He hates their, the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He seeks to bring as many to hell with him as he possibly can. Lord God, may that not be the heritage that thou has given unto us. We pray, our Lord, have mercy upon thy church. Heal her of her many divisions. We pray, our Father, that thou would grow us as thy people in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, that we would love thy truth and righteousness. At our Lord, we would stand fearlessly without compromise for uh, that which thou has revealed to us in thy word and which has been summarized in faithful confessions, catechisms, covenants. O oh Lord, we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but as a church, Lord, we would seek uh, to worship thee purely in the uh, forms that alone thou hast ordained in thy word, but that we would also seek to worship thee purely by way of faith and trust in Jesus Christ and love for Christ and his commandments, to walk in obedience unto thee, delighting in walking in obedience, not complaining about how narrow the path is, but, O oh God, rather how thankful thou hast pl uh, we are that thou has placed us on that narrow path, for we would not have chosen it. If it were up to us, we would be walking upon the broad path that leads to destruction. Our Lord and our God, we pray, sanctify thy church. We pray, Father, that thou would bring about a blessed unity and uniformity in, in truth. We plead with thee, O Lord our God, bring in the Gentile nations into the visible church, even thy people, the uh, thine ancient covenanted people, Israel, bring them into thy church as a covenanted nation. We plead with thee, our Lord, put down all of thine enemies, all false religions. Cause them, our Lord, uh, to hide in the caves, to cover their faces against thee, our God, thy glory. We plead with thee, bring thy holy judgment, thy righteous judgment upon those who are thine enemies and who will not turn in repentance and faith to thee and cause, Lord, those whom thou hast chosen to be brought out of these false religions, even out of mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, out of Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism, Mormonism, out of uh, Jehovah Witnesses. Lord God, we plead with thee, save thy people through Jesus Christ. And Father, draw this nation unto thyself. Cause this nation to, to see and, and understand how they have, this nation has turned against thee how it has walked in its own rebellious ways, though bound by even faithful covenants, the solemn league and covenant, O God, it has trampled under, underfoot even that covenant, has hated and despised it, has forgotten it. And even thy people, O Lord, to our shame have forgotten it. But Father, we pray that thou would rise, raise up a, a faithful generation and that would look unto Jesus Christ, look unto these, unto this faithful covenant, that it would, Lord, once again be sworn as a 
covenant over this nation. Grant, Lord, repentance to this nation for its idolatry, false worship, uh, for its blasphemy and heresy, for its covenant breaking and Sabbath breaking, for its murder of unborn children, and for its practice of every form of immorality, and more and more justifying and excusing and even legally uh, uh, exonerating those and promoting those who do such things. We pray our Father that thou would, would bring this nation unto Jesus Christ, that thou our Lord would show forth thy power for thou art the God who rules over all nations. O God, the, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water he turneth it whithersoever he will. And so, Lord God, we plead with thee that thou would be with our brethren in various places of the world who are suffering under tyranny, who are suffering under ungodly uh, governments, uh, who are being persecuted for truth and righteousness sake, uh, whose property, whose rights, uh, that thou hast granted are being taken away, uh, who are being imprisoned and tortured, who are being murdered. Father, may the blood of thy people that suffer for truth and righteousness sake be the means thou hast chosen to bring gospel prosperity through the preaching of thy word and through the example of thy faithful witnesses. O oh Lord our God, we pray, be with those who are far away from home, who are traveling in the week to come. Grant to them safety, both physically, but also spiritually. We ask our Lord and God that thou would be with those who are suffering afflictions by way of uh, uh, diseases, by way of ill health, uh, Father, that thou would encourage them and come along beside them, that they would look upon their Savior. Father, thou hast promised that as thou wilt heal all of our sins, so thou wilt heal all of our diseases. And we do believe that will be accomplished, whether in this life or in the life to come, in the resurrection of, the, of these corrupt and vile bodies, thou wilt heal all our diseases. And our Father, we pray, give to us a foretaste of that glorious uh, time of bodily resurrection with Jesus Christ. Even now, may we see thy mighty hand work in healing and raising up those who are ill and sick. We pray, our Father, that, that thou would be with the downhearted, and the, the discouraged, as they come before thee today, lift up their spirits to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who has died and has been raised to give unto all those who will put their faith and trust in him hope, to give to them a hope that nothing in this world can take away. We plead with thee, our Lord, that thou would uh, hear our prayers as we pray that thou would be uh, also with Hannah, that thou would bless her, the baby, as her time comes very near to delivering this child. Watch over and keep both her and the baby safe. We pray, Father, for those who are still fighting fires, Lord, for their protection. Lord God, we pray for those families who have lost loved ones. We plead with thee, our Lord, that in the loss of all the property and possessions that people have seen, O oh Lord, in their lives, that this might turn them to, uh, to an inheritance that fire cannot burn, that is reserved for us in heaven. We plead with thee, our Lord, that thou would bless now thy word as it goes forth, that thou, our Father, uh, would cause and send forth thy spirit uh, to convict us of sin, to challenge, Lord, us where we have become apathetic, to... Uh, comfort us and encourage us where we have suffered for truth and righteousness sake. O oh Lord, we pray 
that thou would direct thy word as it is a means of grace unto us, like a pipeline from heaven into our very souls, channel thy grace into our hearts and our souls even now through thy word as it's read and as it is preached to the glory of our God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our New Testament scripture reading this Lord's Day is taken from John chapter 11. And we continue where we left off last Lord's Day. John chapter 11, verse 30. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, <clears throat> Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou wouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go, that many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, 
being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied <clears throat> that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, <clears throat> but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves, as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. It's interesting that both Mary and Martha say to the Lord the same thing or ask the same question. looking for an answer from the Lord. Lord, if thou had been here, our brother would not have died because thou would have raised him, right? <clears throat> As if the Lord could not have raised him from a distance, having heard that he was ill. The Lord did not uh, come immediately. He waited a, an extra two days where where he was when he first heard that Lazarus was sick. He delayed his coming. And how often does the Lord delay in your life and mine in coming when we are pleading with him? Come, Lord, come. But he has a purpose. He said he waited that his glory might be shown, that his glory might be seen. We're, we're tired of waiting. Uh, we need patience. We need to see that God's glory is far more important than our suffering. And God will be glorified even through our suffering, our trials, and our afflictions. Lazarus came forth physically from the dead, having been dead four days. It is the same way that no one comes forth spiritually unless God raises him first from the dead. There is no life in our souls toward God. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And until God gives us life, we cannot believe in him. We cannot trust in him. Until he causes us to be raised spiritually from the dead and causes us to be born again, there is no life in us. And we must give glory to God because the faith is a gift from God. The faith he has given is not ours, which we had, but is a gift given to us. And all who are born again, all who are raised spiritually will believe in him. And all who believe in him will never be lost. The Lord says and teaches. Praise be to his name. Our text this Lord's Day is taken from 1 Kings chapter 18 we'll be focusing our attention today upon verses 30 through 35 first kings 18 30 to 35 and elijah said unto all the people come near unto me and all the people came near unto him. 
And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar. And he filled the trench. Uh, he filled the trench also with water. If we would see the holy fire of God alight and produce heat within our lives in order to serve and to love the Lord Jesus Christ above everything in the world and to burn up the chaff that is in our lives, the backsliding, and the rebellion against his revealed will, we must begin by rebuilding the altar unto the Lord that has fallen into disrepair. The altar represents, dear ones, the worship and the service that sets forth Jesus Christ and his precious gospel. The altar declares to God and all who know you who is on the throne of your life, you or Jesus Christ. I wonder what would your wife or what would your husband or what would your children or what would your parents or what would your friends say was on the altar or the throne of your life? You, your work, your pleasures, or Jesus Christ? Popular Christianity teaches that Christians have nothing to do with their past sins. Since nothing in the past can be changed, don't worry about the past. Simply start afresh and forget about the past as if it never happened. But dear ones, the Lord through his prophet Elijah speaks to you today that you cannot move forward in coming to Christ or in growing in Christ if you do not earnestly repair the altar that has broken down by confessing your sins, your rebellion, and your backsliding of the past unto the Lord against whom you have sinned. You must not seek, dear ones, to offer your life on the altar of your former gods that you serve thinking you can keep those gods and serve the Lord at the same time, whether those gods be money, whether those gods be work or your bank account or your pleasures or your clothing or the way you look, whether it be your body and your, your health, whether it be your family, the lusts of the flesh, whether it be sports and entertainment, whether it be music, or the approval of others. No, you can't build upon that altar. 
you must destroy that altar. You must build upon the altar that you repair, that the Lord commands you to repair. You must restore the altar and worship to Jesus Christ, which has already been laid by the Lord in his word that he has given unto us, to which nothing is to be uh, added and from which nothing is to be subtracted other than what he has given unto us in his holy word. And if, dear ones, that is just too hard, to bring your worship to the Lord upon an altar that he alone has authorized. If it's just too difficult for you, then it's better that you simply be honest and simply confess that you do not want the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior to be the Lord of your life, of your family, in the church or in this nation. You want your own altar that is dedicated to the gods that you serve. You see, this is the message which the Lord challenges us with today. We will be considering today four steps that Elijah took in preparation or fire from the God of heaven. Four steps. I'll mention each of those steps as we get to them in the course of the sermon. The first step, Elijah calls the people to come close. 1 Kings 18.30 And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him. The 450 prophets of Baal have now exhausted themselves physically and emotionally after six hours of jumping up and down, dancing around, and even uh, cutting themselves with swords and spears and lancets. This was a bloody mess. They could not go on seeking to get the attention of a lifeless God who cannot speak or hear or act. Baal has failed. There was only silence, no fire. The sky was unchanged. He is not the one true living God that answers by fire. All attention now is focused on the only one who is willing to stand for Jehovah God on Mount Carmel, Elijah the prophet. Elijah now calls the people to come close and to come near him so that they can see for themselves the steps that he takes, because those steps that he takes are instructive. They communicate truth. It's not just aimless and purposelessness that he now follows in the steps that he takes. There's a reason for these steps. And he wants the people to see those steps that he takes as he offers the sacrifice to the one true living God. He wants them to see as well that there are no funny tricks here going on. Uh, this is not a sleight of hand. He is not a magician. He is the prophet of the living God. Dear ones, the truth of Jesus Christ likewise does not fear the light of investigation. 
It is sin and error that does not want to be exposed by the light of the truth. This is why Jesus Christ and all who stand with him are so often despised and hated, maligned and persecuted because people hate the truth. More than anything else, they hate the truth. They hate Jesus Christ. As the Lord Jesus says in John 3, verses 19 through 20, light, speaking of himself, light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. There was even as Christians, why, why do we lash out in anger at a husband or at a wife, at a parent or at a child or at, at a friend who has brought to us light, who has exposed something in our life by way of sin or error? Why do we lash out in anger at them? Why do we say, well, he's not perfect or she's not perfect either? Why do we make excuses for our sin? Why do we shift the blame to others? You see, that anger in our lives reveals we do not want to give up that cherished sin but rather we want to protect it if we wanted to give give that cherished sin up we would fall upon our faces and we would praise god for revealing the sin in our life that he shows to us even when the minister of god preaches and the holy spirit applies the sermon and the word of god to your life or when a loved one comes to you, or a friend comes to you. You see, dear ones, the conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit, who uses ministers, who uses husbands, wives, parents, children, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. The conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit is not your enemy. It is your friend, your friend. For like pain, it tells you that you are spiritually ill and need the healing and help of the great physician, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear ones, praise God for his conviction in revealing our sin. The second step that we see in these verses. Elijah repairs the altar of the Lord. In verses 30 through 32. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as, as great as would contain two measures of seed. Carefully note here, Elijah did not use the altar to Baal that had just been most recently used by the prophets of Baal. Elijah was not about to go back and use in worship that which was corrupted by idolatry. He would not mix that which was corrupt with that which was pure in worship. And neither, dear ones, should we 
Should we build our worship to the Lord upon ceremonies like bands, images, uninspired hymns, drama, dancing that have not Christ's appointment in the New Testament? Or holy days like Christmas or Easter that have not the Lord's authority in the New Testament to be observed? No, no, no. That would be like Elijah taking the altar of Baal and offering his worship to the Lord upon it. God forbids it as we see from the very example of, of Elijah here, which is to our instruction, to our admonition. That's why he brought the people close so they could see he was not using the altar of Baal, but was rebuilding the altar of the Lord. Elijah also, dear ones, did not start afresh in building a brand new altar that did not exist and dedicated to Jehovah. Elijah did not want to convey to the people that he was beginning something new here, something new and exciting, a new religion, new worship to God. He was not starting, dear ones, a new church. He was continuing the same church the same religion, the same worship that God had instituted and appointed for his people at Mount Sinai. He did not want to be disconnected in history from those who were faithful and preceded him. Elijah was here demonstrating the historical connection and continuity to the same church of Israel that God covenanted with at Mount Sinai. The God he served and the religion he practiced was the same as that of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Solomon. Likewise, dear ones, we should not see ourselves as starting a new church or introducing something new into worship, nor should anyone else but rather we should restore and rebuild the altar that has fallen down, the faithful worship and religion unto the Lord Jesus Christ, taught in scripture, summarized in our confession of faith and catechisms. That altar that has been forgotten and has fallen away by way of backsliding. Dear ones, we show our unity and our continuity with the faithful church of Scotland in its most pure times by way of following in their footsteps as they worship the Lord God in, a, that, in all that is in, in, uh, in agreement with the Holy Scripture. So likewise, we walk in their footsteps. We rebuild the, the, the altar that has fallen into disrepair. We do not erect a new one. We do not join in the altar of Baal. We rebuild the one that the Lord has already given to us in history and in the word of God. Elijah chose a spot there on Mount Carmel where there was an altar that had been built already unto Jehovah by the faithful that preceded him. It is called here the altar of the Lord that was broken down. That is the altar of Jehovah that was broken down. Perhaps it was a, a known altar 
uh, well known. And perhaps that is in part why Elijah to chose Mount Carmel to go to that particular location. An altar that had been built before the temple in Jerusalem had been built, but had been cast down by idolaters. What is evident is that Elijah was calling the corrupt, idolatrous, and backslidden people of Israel that had broken down the altar and the worship of the one true living God. He was calling them back to the God who in love had chosen them to be his people, who in love had redeemed them out of bondage in Egypt, who in love had entered into covenant with them to be his people, for him to be their God there at Mount Sinai. For Elijah rebuilt the fallen altar and the, and the testimony of the Lord, not with 10 stones, but with 12 stones, signifying the 12 tribes of Israel calling them back to that time when they became God's people, calling them back to remember the covenant that they had forsaken, the love of God they had abused. The Lord Jesus Christ, who was represented by every sacrifice offered unto the Lord, calling them back, from their backsliding. Elijah was calling Israel to repentance for having torn down the altar and the worship of Jehovah and having built altars throughout Israel to Baal. An altar, dear ones, is also like a throne that acknowledged the God who was worshiped and served and there were many thrones, many altars to Baal, but the altar to God had been cast down. The stones of the altar to Jehovah, God says in Exodus 20, verse 25, were not to be cut. They were not to be shaped by tools, but untouched by man's works. You see, the Lord would have us to know as he would have Israel to know at that time that it's not your work, it's not your righteousness, it's not your obedience, it's not your love, it's not your faith that makes you acceptable before God. It's nothing that you can do or have within you that can make you acceptable before God. It is not your works. It is entirely the work of Jesus Christ, his grace, his mercy, in which we rest alone, that makes you acceptable before God. All your works, dear ones, that you would offer are tainted, are tainted with sin. None of them escape the taint of sin. And only the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ upon that divine altar of the cross can make you acceptable to God. If you believe, if you believe that God should welcome you into heaven because you are good, because you're nice, because you help others, then you still do not understand that you are a sinner before God and you deserve his condemnation, his just and righteous condemnation. And God, the righteous judge, you do not understand, condemns you. For all that you have done, in this life, no matter how good you think it may be, cannot erase, it cannot remove the stain of sin 
in your life, in your soul, in your heart. You cannot remove it. That which you do cannot take the sin away. Only Jesus Christ can take the sin away. Only his shed blood for you as a sinner can take the sin away and make you righteous now and for all eternity in his sight. Only his righteousness, only his obedience is an obedience and righteousness and goodness which God will accept. And when you trust in him, he credits, he accounts the righteousness of Christ to your account so that God then views you, sees you as righteous as Jesus himself. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me not by your works of righteousness, but by me alone and my sacrifice and my righteousness. Though Israel had torn down the true and faithful altar of the Lord through their idolatry and through their covenant to breaking, he, as God's prophet and as God's minister, was rebuilding that altar to the glory of God. Dear ones, if you would see reformation and sanctification in your life, in your family, in the church, in the nation, dear ones, the old altar must be rebuilt. The altar to the Gods of this world must be destroyed. God's altar is not going to be one altar among many. If there is going to be reformation, it must be the only altar which you establish, in which this nation establishes. If there is to be reformation in this nation, so many, sadly, so many Christians believe that you can have all these altars on the Mount Carmel, and there is one, the altar to Jehovah, along with all these others. And everybody can pick and choose which altar they want to, to use. But dear ones, there is no such thing. There is only one altar that God, of which God will approve. And that is the altar that he has ordered and sanctioned and appointed in his word, his worship. The testimony that he gives, he must sit upon that throne, that altar. He must be the one to whom we look alone if there is to be reformation in our families, in our lives, in our, in our, in, in our church, and in the nation. You see, dear ones, you must go back to the old paths. Jeremiah 6, 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. We want something new. We want something innovative. We want something exciting. We want something that's going to entertain people. It's going to fill the pews the chairs that's going to bring in a lot of money so that we can build these huge buildings and yet it is not the altar of the lord that is rebuilt so often in these so-called places of worship but rather it is building upon the altar of Baal. It is constructing their own altars. We're also reminded that we are not to move or remove the old landmarks which our faithful forefathers have established and that are that are faithful and 
faithfully summarize the teaching of scripture in Proverbs 22, 28, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. There, dear ones, there is no other way. There is no other way of true reformation than going back to the old altar. Going back to the altar God has established in his word and has been passed throughout history by those faithful churches that stood for that old altar of worshiping God only and serving God as he has commanded and authorized in his word. Also note here, dear ones, that Elijah, he was not in a hurry to just throw stones uh, uh, in the direction and just kind of throw them up in a heap. Uh, in the quickest way he could possibly accomplish this. He was orderly. He was orderly in restoring the original altar to the Lord. He didn't care if others mocked him and laughed at him because he was restoring an old altar to the Lord God and worship to the Lord. He didn't care that it took him a little more time uh, uh, to restore that altar for the 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. He didn't care about that. He was more concerned that the altar and the worship of the Lord be restored and built correctly and faithfully than that it was done carelessly or that it got the applause of people. Likewise, dear ones, reformation of which God approves in your family, church, nation, is a reformation that is sure and faithful by way of consistency, by way of care for the name of the Lord our God, by way of faithfulness to what God has already revealed unto us rather than innovative and entertaining. It is not that church that can most quickly ordain church officers, that church that can most faithfully do so, and can most faithfully set before the people of God a spiritual and a pure meal that God will bless to their spiritual life and health and growth. But there's an objection here that we might have in our own mind, as well as others. What was Elijah doing offering a sacrifice? He was not a Levitical priest. He was a prophet. And this altar was on Mount Carmel. This was not an, the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. And that is true. However, being a prophet, he did extraordinarily all these things according to the word of the Lord, he says in verse 36. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. And so he had done all that he had done according to the word of the Lord. Elijah was given a supernatural revelation to take these steps. That cannot be claimed by those who take the various steps that they do now in worship. They don't have the revelation of God to do what they do. They simply do it because they want to do it. They think it will draw in more people, entertain more people, bring in more money, but not because God has revealed it in his word. This was the word of the Lord to Elijah to take these steps. Furthermore, Elijah, I believe, is a type and a picture here of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was ordained by God to be our priest even though he was not of the tribe of Levi, but of the tribe of Judah. 
and was a priest forever after the order, not of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek, an everlasting priest for his people. And he offered his life on an altar, not within the temple, but he offered his life upon the cross outside of Jerusalem. And so Elijah's, the steps that he takes here are pointing to, once again, the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that Jesus would accomplish. The third step. Elijah looks to the sacrifice. 1 Kings 18, 33. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood. In this next step, care is taken by Elijah to place wood upon the altar in an orderly fashion and to slay the bullock, placing the sacrifice upon the wood. Which is greater, the altar or the sacrifice? Jesus had condemned the Pharisees because they would swear oaths upon, uh, by way of the altar, but not by way of the, the gift or the sacrifice because they could have thought that they could escape their promise because they had not sworn by the sacrifice but by the altar itself. Jesus says, this isn't, you know, the, a slain animal doesn't mean anything if it's not upon the altar. Just to slay an animal uh, in, in, you know, in common use doesn't mean that the animal is, is a sacrifice. But when that animal is placed upon the altar, the altar sanctifies that sacrifice. And that's true. Not in any way downplaying the altar. But I am asking, which is more important, the sacrifice or the altar? Which is greater, the sacrifice or the altar? To what did Elijah look as that which would cleanse God's people of sin, the altar or the pure sacrifice that points to Jesus Christ? In New Covenant language, which is greater, the cross that is the altar or the Lord Jesus Christ that hung upon that cross as God's sacrifice for sin. As important as is the altar and the outward forms by which you worship the Lord, which is the altar, what is most important is the Lord Jesus Christ, the object of your worship, the object of your faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Never think you have worshipped the Lord Jesus simply because you have used the right altar, the right forms of worship. For if you are not looking to Jesus Christ with the eye of faith and with the heart of love for who he is and all that he has accomplished for you, it is all vain and useless worship. All that Elijah was doing by way of preparation had as an end the sacrifice for sin, which he would call upon the Lord to receive on behalf of all who would look in faith to Jesus Christ, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. When standing for the altar and the outward form of worship becomes more important to you than the life, death, resurrection, glorification, and the rule of Jesus Christ over your life, over your family, over the church, and over the nation, and over the world. You may have built a biblical altar but you act as though the altar was an end in itself, when in fact the altar 
points to the sacrifice, points to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, dear ones, is your life and your very reason for living. Without him, there is no forgiveness of sin, no matter if you've built the right altar. Without him, there is no righteousness accounted to you, even if you build the right altar or rebuild the right altar. Without him, there is, dear ones, no hope but only darkness, the darkness of God's holy wrath and condemnation awaiting you. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is love forever, forevermore, pardon of all sin, righteousness in him, help, provision for all your needs, preservation to keep you secure in him, Elijah was looking in faith to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask you today, where are you looking by faith? Are you looking in faith to Jesus Christ today as your only hope of eternal salvation? Or are you trusting in something else? Do you have other gods that you have chosen to serve rather than the one true living God? You see, dear ones, there must be a daily inspection of, of your life in the presence of God. That love for Jesus Christ has not become a love that you have left behind for something else. Even for that which may be good, we can leave behind our love for Jesus Christ for things that in this that God has given to us in this life that are good, whether our family, whether our, our jobs, whether our possessions, uh, or even the ordinances. We can look to them uh, rather than to Jesus Christ, the ordinances, the sacraments, the testimony of our faithful forefathers. Your altar and outward worship and profession may be in place, but you have forgotten, if that's the case, you have forgotten who is on the altar. You may have a name. You may have a name that you are alive because you have the right form of worship, the right altar, but you may be dead inside you see there was being baptized or coming to the lord's supper is not enough it's not enough and i ask since we are preparing here soon to have the lord's supper do you want to come to the lord's supper because you do not want to be left out is that why you're coming to the lord's supper Everybody else or people you know are coming to the Lord's Supper and you don't want to be the odd person out? Are you coming to the Lord's Supper because you want others to notice you? You want others to see that you have been examined and approved to come to the Lord's Supper as some kind of pride trip? Dear ones, there's only one reason that we come to the Lord's Supper, and that is we come to worship the Lord our God. We come to him, to exalt him, who is our Savior and Lord, who has died for us, who has been raised from the dead, who intercedes for us even now, and to receive of this sacrament as a blessing through which he channels his grace like a pipeline from heaven into my soul and into your soul. If you come for any other reason, it would be better that you didn't come at all. The fourth step, Elijah looks beyond the obstacles. In verses 33b through 35, 
and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. Now, just before Elijah calls out to the Lord in prayer, which God willing, we will consider next Lord's day, his prayer. There's one more step that Elijah takes. He digs this large trench around the altar of the Lord and pours 12 barrels of water upon the sacrifice, the wood and altar so that it fills the trench that was dug around the altar. Most likely this water came from the Mediterranean Sea, which was just below Mount Carmel. We may be wondering that there was a, a drought. Where, where did they find all this water? But that's probably where the water came from. How odd and strange Elijah probably looked to all of Israel. 12 barrels of water poured all over this sacrifice altar, the wood, filling the trenches. What was the point of all this? Well, I suggest it was to make clear that even the greatest obstacles, trials and temptations and opposition or adversity that you may face in your life is not able to prevent the Lord from sending his holy fire from heaven to see reformation when the Lord Jesus and his worship is restored in your life and in your family and in the church and in the nation and in the world. That much water certainly demonstrated that any ordinary fire of man would not be able to consume the sacrifice. This would take the supernatural fire of God by his spirit to consume this drenched offering. Beloved, as long as your eye of doubt is on the water that drips from the altar and fills the trench around it, your eye of faith will not be on the one true living, eternal, almighty God that supernaturally sends fire from heaven and has already in history consumed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has already received and been satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who has already overcome all your obstacles, enemies, trials, and afflictions. Why is our eye on the water rather than upon the sacrifice, the resurrected Jesus Christ, who is able to consume whatever obstacles may be in our way. And if he, if in his providence, we must go through those obstacles, he promises that we do not go through anything alone, any trial. We do not face any enemy alone. That almighty God goes with us. In such a case, dear ones, when in, the eye is upon the water, the water, and that's all we can see, is the water. You're trusting. Then, in the arm of flesh, not in the living God to save you and rescue you. You're walking by sight and not by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather than trusting in the supernatural fire that comes from God in heaven, there will only be change, reformation, and sanctification as you restore the altar that is fallen, that is broken down by way of repentance, love, new obedience unto the living God. Restore that worship. Restore that service to God alone. There will only be reformation when he 
Jesus Christ is at the center of that Reformation. When he, the crucified and resurrected Lord, shows and demonstrates it to all that he reigns over all. God be praised. Let us stand in prayer. Our gracious God, we lift up our hearts unto thee. We pray our Lord, forgive us, for we have not restored the, the ancient altar. We have not restored the forms as we ought to, and particularly, Lord, we have not restored the faith and love that ought to be on that altar, or that ought to be a part of that altar upon which Jesus is sacrificed. Our Lord, we pray that thou would have mercy upon us. We are weak, we are frail, we need thee. And Lord, may we not look at the water, because that water was intended to show how great our God is, that nothing, nothing in our life can can prevent us from seeing the fire of God burn up and consume that which we offer unto him is acceptable in his sight. Nothing can prevent that. If God be for us, nothing can stand against us. Our Lord, we plead with thee that thou would work in our lives both to will and to do thy good pleasure and we do pray that thou would use us for thy glory, that thou would grant to us hearts of repentance. Lord, that, uh, that we would turn again unto thee. That we would not consider the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be a burden or to be that which we despise and hate, but to love because it is the means that thou dost used in our lives to draw us into Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers, for we do come to thee through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let's take our Psalters and turn to Psalm 132. be seeing verses 13 through 18. Just as David reigned in Jerusalem or Mount Zion, so Jesus reigns in his church as king, raising up his ministers to feed his flock, his people, and to do it with joy and for the people to shout joyfully unto the Lord because they have been fed by him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be lining the psalm out for our small children and for those who uh, do not have a copy of the Psalter in front of them, so that if you don't have a copy of the Psalter, you can still sing with us as I read a line and then we sing that line together. Be using the tune Elecombe. Dun 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 dun. For God of Zion hath made choice. For God of Zion hath made choice. There he desires to dwell. There he desires to dwell. This is my rest. Here still I'll stay. This is my rest. Here still I'll stay. For I do like it well. For I do like it well. 
her food, I'll greatly bless her poor. Her food, I'll greatly bless her poor. With bread will satisfy. With his bread will satisfy. Her priests are clothed with health, her saints. Her priests are clothed with health, her saints. Shall shout forth joyfully. Shall shout forth joyfully. And there will I make David's horn. And there will I make David's horn to bud forth pleasantly. To bud forth pleasantly. For him that mine anointed is. For him that mine anointed is. A lamp ordained have I. A lamp ordained have I. As with a garment I will clothe. As with a garment I will clothe. With shame his enemies all. With shame his enemies all. But ye the crown that he doth wear. But yet the crown that he doth wear. Upon him flourish shall. Upon him flourish shall. Please stand with me and receive the benediction of the Lord today as it's taken from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>